Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Naresh Rao. And I want to thank everybody at Christ Bangalore uh, for giving me this honor, this privilege. Dr. John Joseph Kennedy, Professor Padma Kumar, Dr. Ajay Kumar, Dr. Kandanes, and most of all, Rishabh, Apurva, Anjali, and Dia. I must admit that I've disappointed Dia because being technologically challenged, I was unable to put the virtual screen of media meet to 2021 behind me. So you can just see a part of the map of India and a part of a picture of the father of the nation. So my apologies, Dia, I'm, uh, I, I, I need to do something which I have not been able to do correctly. Uh, Dr. Rao and everybody and, and that promo, I'm, I'm flattered. I'm honored at all the kind words and all the compliments that have been showered on me. I surely don't deserve all of them. And uh, there is an old saying in Hindi and Bangla. Bangla is my mother tongue. Hindi is my third language. Nazar lag jayega. That means uh, people will, I mean, you draw too much attention to yourself and that's bad. So I will try and avoid drawing attention to myself, including the report on paid news for the press council and the circumstances which led me to resign from the Economic and Political Weekly. And, and try and focus on the topic because the topic is huge. When you talk about the different kinds of crises, not crisis, but crises in plural, which uh, the media in across the world and also in India uh, is currently going through. And again, I don't know whether I should say is or are, because the word media is supposed to be a plural form of medium. But you have the written word, you have the spoken word, you have the audio visual medium and the social media. And I'll try and talk a little bit about all of these. Uh, uh, Dr. Naresh, kindly tell me if my time, it's now 10.15. May I spend 15 minutes giving an overview of what's happening across the world? Definitely. <laughs> 15 minutes about what is happening in India. And then the last 15 minutes looking at the challenges that lie ahead of us. And, and after 11 o'clock, I would like, I mean, I'd be happy to take questions from the audience, from uh, you and from any, anybody else. Um, is, is, is this all right? Is definitely, this... definitely. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, as I, I, I repeat myself, the subject is huge. So I will necessarily have to be, uh, I'm speaking extempore without notes. So, uh, and I'm aware that everything I say is being recorded and perhaps subsequently immortalized on YouTube. So I, I want to be very precise in what I have to say and then during the question answer session, I can try and elaborate on some of the points that have been made. The different kinds of crises in the media is, is I mean, that there are certain aspects and elements of this crisis, which is global, which is international. And they were also relevant to India. And there are certain aspects of these crises and the, that are unique to India. And that's because India is unique in more ways than one. And then to look at the challenges that lie ahead of us. Now, if I can briefly encapsulate what is new and what is old, we could keep, keep talking about the traditional media, the traditional so-called mainstream media and the new media, the internet. When, when you look at the internet, really, I mean, the internet is relatively young when you, go back in time and go back to Gutenberg in the centuries ago, the printing press, and look at where we are today. The transformation has been amazing. And today we live in a planet with somewhere in the region of more than 7 billion people and close to two thirds, close to two thirds of this planet have used the internet, certainly at least once. Now that remaining one third that hasn't, and that would include children, people with, without access to 
computers, access to internet facilities, extremely poor, underprivileged sections of the, uh, of the population. Even that section of the world's population is being impacted by the internet. I, I'll just give you an example. You have a very, very poor person in India who does not have a mobile, who has never used the internet. She or he needs an Aadhaar card, needs to get rice or wheat or some other ration or chickpeas or gram from a, a shop. Ne has, a, has a bank account that has been opened under a government scheme, but she or he cannot read or write. Therefore, has to go to another place to get not just an Aadhaar card, but to use the banking facility. So even if you don't have a mobile phone, and you don't have access to the internet, your life is still being impacted by the internet. I'm going to talk a lot later in this discussion about India and what is unique about India and, and, and the, the penetration of the internet into Indian society. But all I wanted to say by way of a, a, a general statement is that none of us imagined even 20 years ago. Even 20 years ago, we did not imagine that the internet would impact our lives in the way it has at present. Yes, there is a digital divide. There are parts of the world where, you know, relatively fewer people are impacted and more people are there. There are, there are parts of the world where almost the entire population is not just linked to the internet, but it's always on and it's it's like broadband. It's high speed internet, 24 by seven. Now, any of you who are interested in looking at how this has spread across the globe, I would recommend that you go to a website called World Internet Statistics. And you'll see the different plans. There are 200 countries on this planet. And you'll see how the internet has penetrated uh, different parts of the, of, the, of, of, the, of the world. And you'll see the digital divide. You'll see it in a continent like Africa, which has 54 countries. And you'll see there are certain parts of Africa which have very high internet connectivity and other parts which have not. If you look at the two most populous countries in the world, India and China, you, you'll find that in, in, uh, in China, there's a higher proportion of the population that's linked to the internet, well over two thirds. In India, it's a little below that. But soon, India is going to become the most populous country in the world. Not very long. I mean, I mean, every, all, all demographers say in the very near future, some people will say five years, some people will say eight years, some people will say 10 years, that there'll be more people in India than in the People's Republic of China. So when you're just looking at sheer numbers, you're looking at huge numbers. I'm going to come back to some of these issues a little later. So what has changed about the media? Yes reading. People are reading. Of course people are reading. But people are reading less and less on pieces of paper and more and more on screens. Now that has its own implications, but it's a senior citizen like me. I'm about to turn 66. I still love the touch and the feel of a book. I'm a publisher of books. I published 26 odd books. I, I've written or co-authored seven of them. So I, I, I do, I like the touch and the feel of it. Now, I'll just give you a little anecdote to highlight a bigger issue. And I'm gonna come back to where I was talking about the impact of the internet on, on, on human society. Roughly a year ago, when the first wave of the pandemic was receding, an old fogey like me walked into a bookshop. And I said, I, I saw a book. I, I've been reading about the book on the net. It, it was about a relative of the former president of the United States of America, Donald Trump. Her name is Mary Trump. And then she wrote a book about, you know, how my family, you know, created the world's most dangerous man on the, um, and the, the, the planet's most dangerous man. And I'd been reading little reviews and little excerpts. And here I saw this book. And I said, okay, let me pick it up. I took out the money. If I remember correctly, it was 699 rupees. So I paid that money and, 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 and I took the book and I said, 
I'll read it. I, I must read this book. After all, uh, the most powerful man, because Donald Trump was still the president of the United States at that point of time. Within days, within the next few days, on my WhatsApp, I'd received three from three separate people, PDFs of that same book. So I'm a bloody fool, am I? I spend 700 rupees to purchase a book. And here I get it free. Three people have sent it to me. I'm not sure the three people knew each other, one another rather, but it came to me. It's called piracy. This is not new. Piracy is very old. And pirates only pick the most popular works, whether it be books, whether it be films, whether it be songs, whether it be music. So if there are 100 songs that are being recorded and, and two are very, very popular, the pirates will first pirate those two and steal the copyright. Same with the books. The books that are being popular, uh, the books that are popular are going to be pirated and pirated first. So what does this mean for the intellectual property rights of the, the music, uh, the, the writer, the, 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 the singer, the composer, any of them? Now your generation, the students of Christ, you haven't paid for your music. My generation, we paid for our music. We would go to the music store and we would spend our, the pocket money that we would earn and, 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 and we would buy first a vinyl disc and then an audio visual cassette, uh, sorry, uh, an audio cassette and then a compact disc. And, and thereafter it, it was VCD video compact discs and then it was a DVD, a digital video disc. And then thereafter uh, we would get, uh, you, you know, and, and now everything is digitized. Now, what does this mean? Intellectual property rights, copyright, brands. Are these as important in the world of the media as it is seen in the world of pharmaceuticals, the, the medicine, the world of medicine? This is a huge question today across the globe because what happened to Mary Trump's book is not unique or not is it unique to me, but what is the difference? The sheer speed, the sheer skill at which not only our works, whether it be the written word, the spoken word or the audiovisual medium, they are pirated and distributed and disseminated. The speed and the skill is mind boggling. It's never happened before. Who could have imagined 20 years ago that you would carry in the palm of your hand, your daily newspaper, your weekly magazine, your book, your radio station, your television channel, your film, and more, your, your camera, and more. You can buy a ticket to go somewhere, fly somewhere, take a bus, hire a vehicle. These days, not that many people are watching films in a cinema hall, but you can book a ticket for a cinema hall. You can purchase. You can purchase things. You can purchase not only things from your neighborhood store, you can go ahead and, 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 and gift something to a friend who might be located thousands of miles away. So the internet has changed human society in ways that we could never have imagined and at an incredibly rapid pace. Now, this has had a huge impact on the media. Newspapers are shutting down, newspapers continue to shut down. Radio stations, yes, I know. People continue to hear. The radio has certain advantages that other media don't have. It's the only media that you can consume while you're driving a bicycle, driving a car, running, jogging, cutting vegetables, having a bath. And of course, there is, of course, the audiovisual media. Now, I can go back in time and go step by step and look at everything, but today, because I don't have the time, I will merely flag three or four points. Much of the mainstream media, so-called mainstream media, much of the so-called legacy media, they depended on advertisers, on advertising. And many of the large media organizations, you'll find 90, 95, 99% of their total income would be coming from advertisers, sponsors. But that meant also, he who pays the piper calls the tune. The advertiser would also determine or have an influence, sometimes overt, sometimes covert. For instance, just a, a trivial example. 
Coca-Cola is a big advertiser on your media channel or your media platform or your, your newspaper or your magazine or whatever. Now, if you say it, here is a study which shows that the Coca-Cola that has been produced has been laced with insecticides, pesticides. And that's not good for your health. Okay, you publish that. Will you continue publishing it? Coca-Cola says, I'm going to withdraw the ads. So when you depend on advertisers, the advertisers have an influence on the editorial content, on what you read, what you watch, what you hear. This is also, and this is where, when I come to India, I'm going to tell you, the dependence on the government and government advertising has gone up in India. And this is also an important reason why you see such a large section of the media in India so subservient, so supine, so blind in praising the government and so parsimonious in criticizing the government. And this is where I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm moving from the world to India. Yes, dependence on advertising and advertising driven media started coming down first with television, certainly the internet. 13 years ago, the great recession saw advertising incomes or advertising expenditure across the globe coming down or stagnating or certainly not going up at the pace it had. All of this had a huge impact on the media. But what you also saw that monetizing your content on the media became a that bigger challenge. And this is something I'm going to come back to over and over again. You don't want to pay for what you read. I mentioned earlier, you don't want to pay for what you hear, the music you want to hear. So who pays the writer? Who pays the editor? Who pays the photographer? Who pays the, uh, uh, the composer? Who pays the singer? Who pays the graphic artist? Does she or he have to give everything free? Then how does she or he support her or his family? How are the home fires burning if everybody wants everything free? So are you, going to willing, are you willing to pay for your content? Are you willing to pay for quality content? This is the biggest challenge. It is a huge challenge across the world and also in India. Because people want everything free. And if you want everything free, you're going to get a lot of trash. You're going to get a lot of fake news. You're going to get a lot of pornography because it's coming to you free and you don't know how it is being produced. For all you know that you as a consumer, you're getting it free. Look, India is unique. We're the only country in the planet with 17 languages on our currency note. There are five languages which are there in the eighth schedule of the constitution of India, which are not there because they have a common script. And there's one language which is not there in the eighth schedule of the constitution of India, which is there on the currency note. And that's English, the language I'm using to communicate with you. And that's because of the legacy, the colonial legacy. And therefore it was kept out of the eighth schedule. People ask, what is India's national language? Some people say Hindi, oh my God, no. We have 21 quote unquote national languages. We have a Rashtra Bhasha. We have a one Raj Bhasha or a few Raj Bhashas and 21 Rashtra Bhashas. So language, this is a subject of a bigger discussion or a bigger presentation or some other point of time. But one of the most unique aspects of India is its linguistic diversity, its cultural diversity, its religious diversity, its geographical diversity, it is diverse, it's heterogeneous, it's plural. More plural, I would argue, than any other country on the planet. But does the media reflect this heterogeneity? Answer no. Does the media reflect the diversity of this great nation of ours? Answer no. Because the corporate media, the, the, the government funded media, 
the 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 profit making media the media that's more interested in in making big bucks out of you or or treating you more like a consumer instead of a citizen they would do the reverse they would tend to homogenize they would try and present that homogeneous not a diverse reality a homogeneous reality heterogeneity as opposed to homogeneity that is one of the major drawbacks of the media in india the other drawback as i mentioned a little while ago is that in recent past in the recent past and, and particularly after the pandemic the dependence on government advertising has gone up now you see the pandemic has changed uh, the world media i mean it was the uh, the director general of the world health organization who used the word infodemic it's not just a pandemic the infodemic so i'm going to come a little bit later to the fake news the false news and how it is devastated lives the the, the sheer volume of half truths of untruths of biased information of propaganda that has flooded your screens is unprecedented again propaganda is not new fake news is not new fake information is not new forgery piracy none of this is new but but the sheer scale the sheer speed the sheer volume at which today you are being bombarded with false fake half true information is unprecedented never happened in the history of human kind return to india yeah we are unique even in terms of the media we still have about 100000 publications registered with the registrar of newspapers of india we are unique in terrible ways we are the only one of the 200 countries on the planet earth who claim we are not just a democracy we are the world's largest democracy where news and current affairs on the radio is still a monopoly of the government of india imagine you have hundreds and thousands of privately owned fm radio stations and community radio stations but all india radio akashwani prasar bharati has a monopoly on news and current affairs so people get around this in devious ways in between you know rjs get around this in devious ways in trying to provide you information now this is amazing considering that this is india india is unique in more ways than one in 1991 when the phase of economic liberalization globalization started in india we had one broadcaster one broadcaster doordarshan prasar bharti it was in 1994 that the first privately owned news channel entered the fray and before that there was star sta satellite television asia region there was mtv etc etc from one broadcaster today we are the only country in the world where the ministry of information and broadcasting has given permission uplinking and downlinking permission to 900 television channels from across the world and out of them roughly half about 300 400 of them roughly 400 of them claim their news and current affairs channels but what do you get to see on the screen is it either news or current affairs is it propaganda is it entertainment is it edutainment is is uh, two snakes getting married big news look what the media did to the death of sushant after the death of sushant singh rajput just one example look at the way the media handles information in its desperate grab in its desperate attempt to grab your eyeball today you know that this whole television rating system this television audience measurement system is not just inadequate it's not just flawed it's corrupt it's manipulated and corrupt you needed one arnab goswami and one republic television to tell you the 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 uh, the criminal cases are pending in mumbai but when you have a population which is as diverse as india when you have television having penetrated and internet having penetrated to so many households 
measuring audiences. Why is audience measurement important? Because then the advertisers know where to advertise or not to advertise. The whole system is corrupt, manipulated, flawed, inadequate. This is a subject of a separate lecture, which I'll be happy to give you, should Christ want me to give it to the management students. Now, what else is unique about India? Today, India has one point, roughly 1.35 billion, 135 crore people, roughly. More or less, yes. Soon we'll overtake China, as I mentioned earlier. 1.35 billion, 135 crore. How many SIMs are there in India? Any of you have bothered to check that out? Go to the website of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. That is TRI, T-R-A-I. What is a SIM? A subscriber identity module. It's a little chip inside your mobile phone. When I last checked, this year, earlier this year, there were 115 crore, 1.15 billion SIMs in the country. What does this mean? That in most parts of India, there are more SIMs than human beings. Or many parts of India, not just cities like Bang Bang Bangalore, or Delhi, or Kolkata, or Mumbai, or Hyderabad, or Chennai, or wherever. It's even gone to the smaller towns, not just the smaller towns, even the villages. Now, just because you have 115 crore or 1.15 billion SIMs, it doesn't mean there are that many mobile phones. Now, these are not precise estimates, but what are called guesstimates, G-U-E-S-S-T-I-M-A-T-E-S. Most guesstimates will say there are about 750 odd mobile phones in the country at present, cellular phones. Many of them have two SIMs. That's not all. Out of these, roughly half, maybe a little more than half, are supposed to be smartphones, internet enabled phones. That means they are <coughs> enable you to access the internet. I, I, why do I come across this figure? WhatsApp, WhatsApp claims it has more than 400 million users, more than 40 crore users in India. It's the biggest market for WhatsApp. It's a free end-to-end -end encrypted messaging service on the planet. China, of course, doesn't have WhatsApp. So what we have to understand, and this is where we have to put India in that global context over and over again, is that today the internet, which was supposed to democratize society, which was supposed to empower the underprivileged, which was supposed to weaken autocracies, have actually become not just a part of the status quo of human society, they are controlled by a few giant monopolies. It's oligopolistic in structure. F double A or triple A it used to be AAA, F-A-A-N-G, Facebook, Apple, Alphabet, Alibaba is now in a bad shape, Netflix, Google, take Alphabet. Alphabet is what Google, including Google, what else? YouTube, most importantly, Alphabet Incorporated, the group of companies, controls or is the owner of your Android operating system on your mobile. And most phones in, this, in the world use Android operating systems. Only a relatively small number use Apple, the Apple operating systems. This is Alphabet for you. Also Google. And Google itself has only, I mean, it controls what you hear, what you watch, what you see. Take the case of Facebook, it's a young company, very young. It's not Facebook that we're talking about alone. It's Instagram, it's WhatsApp. Then you have Apple, then you have Microsoft. These are the biggest corporate conglomerates on the planet today. Yeah, China has shut them out, not India. 
these are these giant companies, whether you like it or not, they are having a huge influence on what you read, what you watch, what you hear. It's not just what you wear, what you eat, what films you watch, what music you like. You will realize that they are trying to control your mind, your behavior, your political preferences, your choices about what to do and what not to do. Then try and anticipate your behavior. That's the new business model. They're private profit making entities, they're profit maximizing entities. Those who are interested in the subject, at, there, are, there is a thick book, Soshana Zuboff. You must read it. It's called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. You must read it. It's a thick book. It's intimidating, but it's an amazing book. Those of you who have focused on the audiovisual, uh, or on, on, the, on, the, on the screen, on Netflix, go and watch a film called The Social Dilemma. Dr. Zuboff, Professor Zuboff features in that. The Social Dilemma, which will tell you this is your new addiction and it's more addictive than alcohol and cocaine and nicotine. There are two categories of service providers or industries or businesses which describe their consumers as users. One of them is the social media. Facebook and Apple and Google and the other, the drug pushers, the drug sellers, both these categories of businesses call their consumers users. Now what we are seeing across the world and also in India is the weaponization of the social media. We are seeing this media, these media being used to put out false, hateful content. And in certain respects, it's even worse than pornography, which demeans the body of a person, usually a female, objectifies her or him. What we are seeing today is in certain respects, even worse. And it's not just violence on, I mean, it, it is violence on the screen. It's not when, when you're watching gangs of Wasepur or you're watching uh, Tarantino's films, you know that that's tomato ketchup and not blood. But what happens in India is when there was a poor laborer who was killed by a fanatic who's right now in jail. And that gruesome sequence of him being burnt to death was recorded on video and distributed widely. When the police came and said, who's done it? WhatsApp says, look, end-to-end -end encryption. We don't know who's done it. This is the reality of the world and India. In the last several years, there have been numbers of cases of mob lynching. Usually people belonging to the minority community, they've been lynched. And without fail, behind each and every incident of mob lynching, there is a WhatsApp message. There is the social media. This, the internet, is the classic double-edged sword. It cuts both ways. Yeah, of course. Am I saying do without the net? No, of course not. I mean, you may not remember numbers. When I was a young person, I would remember dozens and dozens of numbers. I don't remember all the 10 digits of uh, all the numbers of most people. I, I, with some difficulty, I remember my wife's number. I don't remember my children's phone numbers. Memory. Google. You don't have to go through books and old clippings. Information is available 
at the click of a mouse. Not just information, so many services. I mentioned this earlier. You remember, I mean, it's when you say social media, not just remembering birthdays or anniversary or sharing pictures, I'm not trying to in any way minimize the positive aspects. This is why the social media is what it is. Because in large parts of the world, Facebook has become synonymous with the internet. In India, a similar attempt was made, but it didn't happen. Free basics. There's a whole issue of net neutrality involved. So what I'm trying to say here is that what you watch, what you hear, and what you read are very often influenced by very, very powerful interests. There could be political interests. There could be commercial or business interests. There could be social interests. The entire, one entire section of the population can be demonized. That's what Islamophobia is all about. And if there is Islamophobia in India, the media, the media plays a huge role in spreading Islamophobia. Five years ago, a young relative of mine, he came and said, you know, not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslim. I said, where did you get to know about it? WhatsApp. That's the half truth. Are you trying to say there are no Hindus who have been accused of terrorist activities? Who in, in the city of Bangalore killed Gauri Lankesh? There are many other examples I can give you. Let's acknowledge some facts. One out of seven Indians is Muslim. There are more Muslims in India than in all countries in the world except one, and that's Indonesia. You want to demon, demonize one seventh of the population? The media is doing this? Yes, the media is doing this. Large sections of the media is doing this. How do you encounter these challenges? As Dr. John Joseph earlier pointed out, what is objectivity in journalism? This is a very difficult word to understand and explain. Are we objective or, or are we all biased? We have our old biases. More than 44 years ago, when I became a journalist, I, my editor, Dr. Bhavani Sen Gupta, he's no more. He told me, don't be ashamed when people say you're biased. Say I am proud of my bias because I am biased against the corrupt. I'm biased against those who exploit ordinary people. I am biased in favor of the underprivileged. I'm biased in favor of the voiceless. I want to give a voice to the voiceless. That is my bias. Today, people say, you're a journalist or an activist. I'm a human being. I'm a male, I'm a father. I'm a citizen of India. I'm a journalist. I'm a teacher. I'm an uncle. I haven't yet become a, become a grandfather. My children are still young. So we all have multiple identities. So what? What is wrong with saying that the job of a journalist is to hold truth to power? You know, I use an example which some people have occasionally taken objection to. But I use it nevertheless. Because I say it whenever I'm asked to speak to young people, and I assume there are a lot of young people and not just professors here, you are listening in to me, that I make a comparison between journalists and uh, dogs. Yes, dogs, man's best friend woman's best friend. I'm a dog person, not a cat person. I'll tell you more about that. So I'm going to tell you a few analogies before I conclude my presentation. I have about seven or eight minutes left. In chapter one of your textbook, you have said, man bites dog. 
is news. Yeah, dog bites man is not news. Of course, dog bites man is not news. Dogs keep biting men. So what's news about it? It's only when man bites dog does it become news because it's so bizarre. It's so unusual. But wait, what if dog bites Prime Minister Narendra Modi? What if dog bites Priyanka Chopra? What if dog bites Ivana Trump? What if dog bites Joe Biden? You can be sure it will become news. So it depends on who the dog bites. That's not all. We have also, you know, journalists are often described as watchdogs of society. You know, our, our job is to hold truth to power, to hold accountable those who are holding positions of power and those who are in a position to perhaps misuse that power, their discretionary powers. So it could be anybody who is powerful, a politician, a corporate captain, uh, an important bureaucrat, a military general. It could even be a mafia don, a powerful criminal who runs an organized crime network, all of them. So, a journalist is supposed to be the watchdog of society. There are dogs in the dogs. There are watchdogs. So at four o'clock in the morning, a burglar has tried to burgle and come into your home and the dog starts barking. Oh, the burglar gets scared and, and runs away. Wow, the, bur the burglar doesn't know that the dog uh, can only bark but cannot bite, but no, no problems at all. The dog has fulfilled uh, its role as a watchdog. The, the, the thief or the potential thief has run away. Great. There are dogs and there are dogs. There are watchdogs and there are lap dogs. Godi, the Hindi word for go lap is Godi. Ravish Kumar, the television anchor for NDTV India, talks about the Godi media. The media becomes like a lap dog. The dog wags its tail. When you stroke it, forget biting, forget barking. It's so happy, especially if the lap belongs to an important person, as I mentioned, a, a minister in the government, a, 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 a top ranking general, a, a big time a crook, a, a, a top notch bureaucrat, a, a, the chairman or the president of a company. The dog is very happy. So there are dogs and there are dogs. The question is why and I've, I've told you why. Uh, because of the depend, uh, growing dependence on uh, income from advertising, that we are seeing such a large section, uh, the income from advertising by government and government agencies, we are seeing such a large section of the media in India having become so subservient to the government. Now, let's take a step back. We've talked about dog bites man, man bites dog. And we've talked about lap dogs and watchdogs. The, it's often said, you know, good news is no news, bad news is good news. So that's the logic use. But there is another category, there are another kind, there are other dogs as well. There are dogs that can help a visually challenged person Cross the road. There are dogs that can sniff out substances, drugs, explosive substances from a pile of luggage. That's why dogs are often used by law enforcing agencies. You've heard the story about the St. Bernard dogs and the Alps who rescue people caught in a snow blizzard. What am I? driving at. With all due respect to all my journalist brothers and sisters, you have a job to do. Your job is to ask questions. Your job is to ask difficult questions, not ask the kind of questions that 
this famous Canadian citizen, also known as an actor, called Akshay Kumar, he asked of our Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, how do you eat your mangoes? Do you suck on the mango? Do you cut it? I mean, that, I mean, to interview a Prime Minister and asking these kind of questions, then are you a journalist? Or are you working for an advertising agency? Let's be clear. Are you working in the public relations department of an organization? Or are you a journalist? Now, unfortunately, across the world, and also in India, journalism has become a highly risky profession. And those who are in positions of power and authority are becoming not just increasingly intolerant of those who hold truth to power, who ask difficult questions, who raise questions, who dig up dirt, the muckrakers, but they are also threatening them. So they're not just intolerant, they've become vengeful. And in the last two years alone, in the last year and a half, dozens of journalists in India have been harassed, frauds, fraudulent cases have been lodged against them, first information reports have been lodged against journalists. Criminal cases have been put against them. Many of them, it takes a long time for them, for these to be dismissed. Nevertheless, nevertheless, defamation cases have been filed against me. I can speak on this subject for hours and hours, having been a recipient of a large number of defamation cases. Now, India is among the few countries in the world where defamation is not just a civil offense, but also a criminal offense. This is another subject for a more detailed discussion. So, after the media, uh, uh, after the pandemic, I beg your pardon, the media has become very, very different. Publishing, writing, speaking, the audiovisual medium, as I mentioned earlier, have changed in ways that we could not have imagined. And there are positive aspects, but there are also many, many negative aspects. So we have to be cognizant of both aspects, both the positive and the negative aspects of the new media, the challenges that lie before us. Yes, we want, when we write something, we want people to read what we've written, of course. But are we going to stoop to depths which are not just an issue of sensationalizing and, uh, and, 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 or trivializing, but question of what is the truth? This is not an easy question. We constantly endeavor to search for the truth. And that is an important role as a journalist. I've spent 44 years in the profession. I'm about to turn 66. Today, journalism has become more risky, more difficult, than before in India. And I would urge all my young friends who are listening to me to keep that in mind. What you learn in your college, what you learn in Christ and with the world outside. Yes, you have every reason to be idealistic. You have every reason to be optimistic and hopeful, but keep your eyes and your ears and your nose to the ground to realize the difficulties and the challenges. And I, even at my age, I would like to believe that it's very easy to be pessimistic. It's easy to be cynical and believe that nothing will change. It's far more difficult to be hopeful, to be optimistic. But do remember, when things are really down and things are really gloomy, and all of us have been through this, especially over the last year and a half. I'm a COVID survivor. My daughter had a terrible time. But remember, while you are working, while you're alive, the darkest hour is just before the dawn. So thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen, teachers and students of Christ and other educational institutions who are part of Media Meet 2021. It has been my honor, my privilege to speak with you, and I'll be, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer 
whatever questions that you have for me. Thank you so much once again. Thank, thank you, Mr. Poranjay uh, Um <clears throat> I think uh, uh, you set the tone and uh, uh, even as you were speaking, uh, we uh, started getting the questions. So I'll uh, start with the uh, earliest question that uh, came in. Um, this is from uh, Leander Lingam, and she has uh, this question, has the internet stolen the idea of being exclusive? For example, the killing of Osama was on Twitter before any news channel. Let me answer. Journalists who are in part of the rough and tumble of the 21 uh, or, the, or the 24 by 7 media, there is always this pressure to be the first with the news, to be the exclusive. But there are two kinds of exclusives, to be the first with the news and then be proved wrong. Or would you rather be later in the news, but you're sure of what you write? Verifying facts, double checking is as important as putting it up. Lots of people have made these mistakes. You believe one source, no. Sometimes you need to double check, triple check before you put up, especially information that is of great public importance. So exclusivity in providing information or being the first to provide news is not necessarily a virtue if you cannot do the due diligence. And that's easier said than done. So somebody tells you so-and-so has died. 10 US soldiers have been killed in the suicide bomb blasts in Kabul airport. So you've heard it from one man or one person. Then your first job is to start checking, verification, and then you should put it out. You should see the way the credible news agencies work and you'll understand that they, they don't disguise advertising as news. That's, that's paid news. So yes, exclusive information is easier said. Uh, it's not easy to provide. Now, sometimes this whole, there is a conflict of wanting to speed versus accuracy. And I will say always emphasize accuracy, always err on the side of accuracy instead of speed. The other kind of exclusive information or the exclusive is exclusive analysis, where your research, where your hard work, where your ability to go deep into a subject in depth, not just reportage, but analysis of facts will also make what you put out, what you say, what you write, what you put out on the audiovisual medium, quote unquote, exclusive. Exclusivity, therefore, is a virtue, but it should not be made into a virtue uh, in a way in which it also uh, has its um, uh, the underside, the ugly underside. So yes, uh, Osama bin Laden's capture is there, and of course, Twitter is there, and Facebook is there, and but all I mean, all there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of so-called 24 by seven media, where, where they'll say flash, news flash, just in. Yeah, yeah, we, we are looking for it and then we wait for the details. And then you also come across occasions where people have to retract. There's so much fake information today. We have large numbers of organizations, including websites like Alt News who are doing nothing but fact checking, but telling you there's so much of information which is just fake, false, and untrue. So, uh, Leander, did I get that name correct? Leander, thank you for your question. Um, um, the next question is, uh, if advertisers have an influence, doesn't that affect the public who are trusting the news organization to cover all important stories and be critical of big players? including the government. This is by Erika de Souza. Erika, you are absolutely correct. If, you were, if, if a large proportion of your interview comes from a particular advertiser, it could be a, a company selling a particular product or providing a particular service. It could be a government body. It could be a sponsor. 
then you know you're not expected to bite the hand that feeds you as i mentioned earlier he who pays the piper calls the tune yes so there's bound to be advertising the influence of the ad so what's the way forward? And this is the challenge again. I'm glad you asked this question, Erika, because there are not that many media organizations on the planet who are able to spend money, employ people, spend a lot of money on research and on giving you quality information who depend largely on advertisers. And, and the New York Times is one such example. Uh, in India, we have some websites which are only all behind a paywall. There are some websites which will provide you only a, uh, a few, few articles in a month free and everything else you have to pay for. So you're being urged to subscribe and pay for the information you consume. So this is going to be a new model. And there are also going to be models like uh, the Guardian model, the Wire model, uh, the organizations that are supported by a body like the IPSMF, the Independent and Public Spirited Media Foundation in India, who support uh, you know, organizations are uh, giving them grants. So the not-for-profit kind of journalism where you depend on your subscribers or you depend on your readers, the crowdfunding, these are ways forward, but there are huge challenges in front. It's not just because of the net, we all live in a uh, in an echo chamber and we're all guilty of having what is called a confirmation bias. We only want to hear what we want to hear. I'm leftist, so I only want to hear what the leftists say. I'm right wing, I only want to hear what the right wing say. I'm pro-Modi, so I only want to hear what pro-Modi people have to say. I'm anti-Modi, so I want, you know, we, have, we, we fall into this trap. And, and, and this is exactly what the big social media platforms, the Googles and the, plat uh, and the Facebooks uh, of the world, they put you, they confine you into this echo chamber because they're not interested in truth. They're interested in their content going viral, irrespective of whether it's true or not. They want to make profits. They, they, they want to use the data to, to, to sell it to advertisers. You know, so that is where we are. Now, what we are seeing across the world, and, and we are seeing a, a, a kind of a blowback, a pushback against these giant digital monopolies. It's happening across the world. It's happening in Australia. There, the Australian legislature threatened to pass laws if the providers of content were getting such a minuscule share of the revenue that Google and Facebook and others would get. So these organizations are literally being forced to pay so now they're having their own curated content systems. Uh, you know, the, whole, the, the way the, those algorithms work, uh, see Google, see Facebook. It's happening in the United States, it's happening in Germany, in France, in Canada, not yet in India, unfortunately. If anything, we have become a little more subservient with the new information technology rules to these big guys. Um, Yahoo News has shut up, uh, the, the, has shut down, shut, shut its operations. The way the uh, rules pertaining to foreign investment and the new information technology rules, I, I have doubts about the legality of some of these rules, but in my opinion, uh, they do constrain. They do constrain uh, freedom of expression. They, they do constrain uh, what is a fundamental right of every citizen in this country. And this, that's a right to free expression. And, and the media de derives its right to free expression from Article 191A, of the Constitution of India, which is uh, very, very important. You also have Article 19.2, which lays down what are called reasonable restrictions on the right to free speech. This is a huge subject on some other occasion, maybe I can uh, hold forth on this, but the, this whole, the word reasonable is really the contentious one. Who decides what is reasonable? Is it your local gangster or is it the chief justice of India? Is it your station house officer, the constable, your beat constable, or is it the inspector general of police? Uh, so, you know, these are again, very, very important issues. But to return to the question you asked Erica, as I mean, long as there are large advertisers, including government bodies that sponsor you, the, their influence on what you read, what you hear, what you watch is inevitable. Uh, a similar question. Um by uh, Kushagaram. Kushagaram. 
Uh, if Indians are so parsimonious in being patrons for their choice of media, how can media escape the influence of advertising? It's absolutely correct, Kushagra, if I've got your name correctly. If you're so parsimonious, you don't want to pay for what you read, then you would get trash look. Today, the internet, I mean, look, that's the difference. That's the huge difference that is, that there's a dramatic change that has happened in, in what is called the media scape and the information landscape across the globe. I mean, you, you no longer have a situation of information scarcity. You have information overload. Yeah, there are some people who still don't have adequate information and quality information and information that's relevant, but for a lot of people and increasingly young people, the challenge is to be able to sift, to use a proverbial sieve to, ship, uh, to, to separate the wheat from the chaff, to be able to say, this is important information, this is credible information, this is factual, factually correct information, well analyzed, well researched, well documented, et cetera, et cetera. And this is fake, false propaganda, hateful, deceitful, half true. That is the huge challenge today. That is undoubtedly the, one of the biggest challenges that we today are facing more than ever before. As I mentioned earlier, and I'm repeating what I've said, it's not that rumors didn't exist earlier. It's not that people lied and said utter untruths about individuals, about situations. They, they, they all, such people have always existed. You know, understand the difference between misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation, you can be misinformed. You can be misinformed and you can think I'm 55 years old, whereas actually I'm 66. But disinformation is when you know that I'm 66, but you still say I'm 55, you know? You are deliberately uttering a lie. That is what propaganda is all about. So, okay, uh, Kushagra, I've tried to answer your question as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Quickly, yeah. I think a couple of more questions. Um, is the media pandering to the audiences or is it the one setting the agenda for what news we like to consume? Uh, I didn't, I didn't understand that question. Okay. okay. So basically uh, what uh, Nupur is, is asking pandering? is yeah, pandering to the audiences or is it the one that set, setting the agenda for what the, what news we are supposed to consume? Okay. All right, I got it. Uh, who asked this question? Nupur. Nupur. Nupur, very good question you've asked. Let me try and understand it. Let me try and break it down into two or three, two or three parts. <clears throat> what you describe as pandering, I can put it differently. You can call it popularity. You can call it reach. I've written something. I've worked very hard at it. I made a video. I have, I've, I'm delivering a talk. I'm giving a speech. Obviously, I want more people to listen to it. It is but natural. Am I speaking to a small group of people and I'm very happy talking among a little group of people because I only want to communicate with them? Or am I trying to reach out to as many people as possible? Am I trying, if, if I think I have something to say, something that is of importance, am I not trying to reach out to a wide audience? Of course. So what you call pandering is inevitable. What's this agenda? Everybody has an agenda. You have an agenda, I have an agenda. We might disagree. We may agree. We have an agenda. What is an agenda? I want to communicate something. As I mentioned, you can say it's bias. Of course I'm biased. Even, you know, if I ask you, I've been speaking to you for the last one, one, one hour and 15 minutes. Can you say, if, if I asked you to write a 400 word report, report on what I've said for one hour and 15 minutes, what will you leave out? What will you put on top? What will be your headline? What will be your concluding line? Not more than 400 words. What will be the points you will make? What will the quotes you use? What will the quotes you leave out? That will determine your bias. That will determine your so-called agenda. It's not just what you include, but what you do not include. So the point that I wanted to make, Lukur, is that we all have biases. We all want a wide audience. What is the means you use for an audience? Am I going to utter the untruths to get a wide audience? And am, am I going to ask a, a, a woman to strip naked for a wide audience? Am I going to pervade 
pornography for a wide audience? Am I going to purvey a violent, gut-wrenching scene of murder to get an audience? Yeah, sure. We all want an audience. We all want to, quote unquote, pander to our readers, our listeners and viewers. But what is the means we use? What is the methodology we use? And what is the purpose for what we are saying? What are we trying to communicate? That your agenda is also therefore important. Uh, one last question because of the paucity of time. And I'm just uh, randomly picking this uh, question because it looks like you know, something that uh, I think you've written extensively about it. Uh, with media structures being cut up, can the media still be referred to as a fourth pillar of democracy? This is by Shalini. <laughs> Shalini, uh, you can write a book on the subject, Shalini. <laughs> There's a lot of information. What are the structures? Who is the ownership? Who owns the media? You know, uh, since this is the last, uh, is this the last question, Dr. Naresh Rao? Yeah, unfortunately, we'll have to, you know. All right. Uh, you know, uh, on media ownership, much can be said. And it's not new. Industrialists with business interests have owned the media. Our first prime minister, our first defense minister used to talk about the jute and the steel press. Post-90s, there were media organizations which made so much money from the media that they went into coal coal mining and power projects and all kinds of things. And the fourth estate became real estate. You must have heard that one before. You can practice the journalism of courage if you own a big property in the in Nariman Point. No names, you can guess, very easy. No, I'm, I'm not criticizing anybody. The point is, how do you gain your, how do you get your profits? What is the means for getting it? How do you cross subsidize? You know, these are the structure, of course, determines the content. If you look at, I mean, I mean, there are people who are very, very rich. The corporatization of the media is not new. It's been there. But today, we moved another step. Say the richest man in India, Mr. Mukesh Ambani. He's not just India's richest man. He's Asia's richest man. He's also the biggest media baron. He owns the entire network 18 channel, you know, websites, multiple languages, television channels, etc., etc. Now you can't expect these channels to write something or say something which will be critical of the boss. You know, I mean, they'll say, hey, you want your, you want to you have a job now, you want your salary next month. So I mean, you can't criticize the boss. That's the reality of the world we live in. But there are some bosses who are more liberal than others. We used to have a so-called Chinese wall, it used to say, between the advertising department and the editorial department. There are families and there are owners whose interests are only in the media and therefore they don't need their media or their media organization to promote their other business interests. There are media organizations that are effectively, as I said, dependent on subscribers, dependent on readers and listeners and viewers, and not on advertisers. Read the little disclaimer, for instance, that News Laundry puts out. Why do they seek your support? Because they don't want advertising. So, you know, NewsClick, I, I happen to be associated with NewsClick from May 2018. They're not ad accepting advertising. They, they put everything under the Creative Commons, uh, under, under, under that kind of a... Uh, rubric. So, you know, there are different media structures, different media models, and uh, they're fast changing. They're very fast changing. When should you have a paywall? Say, say morning context in the Ken. They ha they all, they, you have to be a subscriber or caravan or many others. But then they also say, this is free content. Take the economic time. Uh, sorry, the economist. They say, we'll give you two articles in a, in, a, in a month free. The rest you have to pay for. Financial Times, everything has to be paid for. Wall Street Journal, New York Times, will give you a few articles. You know, so these models are evolving. These models are changing. These media structures are changing. And uh, this is a subject for a more detailed discussion. I'm sure that in the course of uh, the deliberations that will follow in this media meet, 
you will have some of these questions coming up. I am uh, given the limitations of time. I'm just flagging some of these issues. They are very, very important issues. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor uh, Dr. Naresh Rao, uh, thank you once again. And, and you know, I have a website, Paranjoy.in. Uh, I also depend on donations. Have a look at it. I work in multiple languages. I, I'm, I'm trying to do. Uh, I, I have uh, been working, as I told you, for 44 years. I've been independent for the better part of the last 12 or 13 years. So there are lots and lots and lots of challenges. I, I'll be happy uh, um, to communicate with some of uh, the students over here. My, my first name, Paranjoy, gmail.com. I don't promise you an early and expeditious response unless you want to pay me <laughs> to teach you. Okay, okay. I'm not joking. I'm playing. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the reality of uh, the world that we live in. I mean, the last year and a half has been very, very difficult for everybody. Uh, the media in India too has gone through very, very time. The number of journalists who had to lose, have lost their jobs in the last year and a half or two, the number of journalists who um, had to take very, very steep salary cuts, it's unprecedented. I've never seen such devastation in the media uh, for more than 40 years. So I end, I conclude, it's 11.24, thank you once again.